kind of crazy too that you would think in a market where it was like what people considered a down real estate market there was still highest and best yeah there was a frenzy of buyers actually right. during that time uh -huh. so most of the property that i sold as an reo listing mm -hmm. broker there i would get into this situation where as a seller there would be more buyers than actually property to sell there's mm -hmm. one property and you've got many people that want to buy it Welcome to the Turning Profit Podcast. Heather, it's so great to be here once again. Yeah, what number are we at? I think we're like 20. I know that you don't know. That's why I asked you. <laughs> well, Keeps you, you humble. Know. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to have to count. You know, so anytime we get past one hand in the counting thing, it's, it's a little difficult, difficult for me. Yeah, I get so. it. I get it. So what are we talking about today? We're going to be talking about negotiating. So how to negotiate the best deal you can as a land investor or a real estate investor in general, because these tips will work for any type of situation. Right, any any real estate or right. even not, but also- right. Even negotiating with you to go out to dinner, these tips will work. Right, like you have to negotiate that. I'm pretty much always down to go out to dinner, so that's not really a- <laughs> No, I mean, as far as the place. Oh, the place, that makes sense. Right. That, that does take negotiations. And you'll be able to use it when you're negotiating to buy the properties and also, you know, on the other side when you're selling yeah, it, right? Yeah, yeah, both the ways. You know, negotiating is very important and I think it's an often overlooked thing. And, you know, negotiating is not about you know, trying to get the best of the other side at all times. It is looking out for your best interests, but um, really the best negotiations produce a win-win for both sides. Well, that's exactly what it is. Yep. That's exactly it. It's where both sides feel like, okay, yeah, if this is good. We can work with this. That's right. And then you've put together a deal. But I think a lot of people in real estate especially forget that. Like they think, oh, look at me holding my hands just like you. No, I, Copy okay. Pete. You right. don't do that. I know. There we go. But I think a lot of people in real estate forget that that's the goal. They forget what they're actually working towards. And mm -hmm. it's putting together the deal. Right. That makes everyone. It's got to be a win win. I say that all the time. It's got to yeah. be a win win, meaning a win on each side, a win for the buyer and the win for the seller. Yeah. When both people walk away and say, okay, this was a good, right. I'm happy, or not walk away, but you know what I mean? The, yeah. The yeah, transaction's yeah. complete. That's right. Okay. Well, that's exciting. I like talking about this kind of yeah, stuff. Yeah. And and uh, are you going to want to talk about your current events as well? Yeah. But there's, you know, what's kind of strange is- Current you, events in real estate investing, that is. Yeah. I don't I don't think they need to know about like current events, what I've done <laughs> the past few days. Really exciting. So pretty current events. You don't want to talk about that. I don't even know. I like, I have no idea. I don't even know half the times, like when there's award shows, I have like no idea who these people oh, are yeah, anymore. I can't stand those things anymore. It's kind of sad. Did it's like a bunch ever, of people though? like patting themselves on the back. I like, know. Yeah, you did such a great job know. for, you know, doing being their in a job. movie or something. Yeah. And I think they get paid a, a pretty good amount, like to cover the work. Mm -hmm. So anyways, but we've never really been up to date on that. So no, we're not going to get started today. But Not the Bachelor? I, did we ever watch that? No, no. Like I don't. Th we watched. What was the one that we did watch? Like we watched Survivor. That was it, and it was like twenty four years ago or something. Yeah, it's crazy how long that show's been on. Gosh, yeah, it's embarrassing. Kind of lost interest after maybe the first or second season, and then mm -hmm. you know, but it's you still going. The, you are the weakest link. Do you remember that? Yes, I remember that. They have that back. That's back. <laughs> I'm not going to watch it. Okay. We don't really watch TV, so we're boring. But anyway, so yes, we're we're not going to be talking about any of that in real estate, though. And I think that there's a big crossover right now, I guess always with just the economy in general. Mm -hmm. And it seems like we're still in a holding pattern. Did I tell you that Morgan, was it Morgan Stanley that said that they thought we were at the bottom mm, yes. of the market? And I thought that if you don't really get how like that works, you might think, oh, okay, we're at the bottom and then prices are going to go back start going back up or whatever will happen. But let's assume that we are at the bottom, which I have no idea if we're at the bottom, but let's assume that it doesn't mean that it's gonna like go back up mm -hmm. right away. It could be that we're at the bottom and it sits at the bottom for the next 50 years. It's not gonna sit for 50 years, but you know what I mean? Being ex exaggeratory there, mm -hmm. it could mean, okay, you're at the bottom in some aspects and then it just stays stagnant, which is my understanding that the 90s were kind of like that. Again, I was not paying attention to real estate values in the 90s or what at all. What were you paying attention to? Gosh, I don't really remember. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I know. Uh, I don't know. High school. Okay. All right. Oh, well, that's good. Boys yeah. and cars. I don't yeah. know. What do you want me to like? I cars, have no idea. Okay. Cars. I liked my car. Okay. I was washing my car a lot. Uh-huh. Yeah. Okay. Are you sorry good. you asked that question? <laughs> I don't know. I'm like, I don't know. Your I liked... Pinto? Is that what you had? Uh, yeah. Uh-huh. <laughs> Just a joke. Coming Heather, from the guy that had, a car that, a Pinto. that had a car that was a half. I had never uh, heard that that was, what was your car? It was a 85 and a half Mercury Lynx, Heather. Right. So, Anyways. Yeah. That was a very fancy car. Yeah. I can only imagine. 
Good times. Right. Um, hmm, interesting. So no, but I think a lot of people are like, talk, like, you know, like, okay, let's say that's the case. I have no idea. So that's kind of, people are talking about it. Bed Bath & Beyond mm, filed bankruptcy yeah. and, and it's not one of the ones where they're expected to come back, but who knows, someone could buy the name and mm -hmm. like, you just don't like all these things. Yeah. Seem well, you know, the interesting thing about that is you told me about that, you know, their leases are, you know, to tie it into real estate, their mm -hmm. leases I like oh, many of the. He's stealing my next line. Okay, here. go ahead. I'll no, let no, you, ha no, no, I'll no, let you it. have it. Say it. Well, you told me that many of the their locations are prime locations, and there was a whole backlog of companies and businesses that you know negotiated with those landlords and property owners in order to to release those properties right away. So they've already got the, a lot of those locked up in those premium locations, at least. Right. A lot of people are like, "Oh my gosh, if they do go out and like they're done, there's going to be more of this commercial real estate. These big kind of huge." buildings mm -hmm. and so a lot of people are thinking well boy that's gonna really tank things but it was the opposite because there hasn't been the growth of that kind of stuff since like 2008 like do you remember back then it was like these the cities would come up and they would do these kind of they're not strip malls i don't know what you call them they're bigger i'm sure there's a neighborhood centers right yeah and so it's like oh no you know what are they going to do with them and it, i can't remember the exact ones but it was like planet fitness um some of these other uh, uh nordstrom rack mm. places like that already yeah swooped in and like we're desperate to sign those. Yeah, leases. we want their spot. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So yeah. it doesn't. So I guess that the the takeaway from that is that even if it sounds like bad news, it doesn't necessarily mean it's bad news for everybody. Mm -hmm. and I think that was a, that one was a long time coming, wasn't it? I yeah. Mean, there was a lot of grumblings about that for quite some time. Yeah, and then people were like betting against their stocks and mm -hmm. weird stuff. But um, I mean, but I knew because when I went into one in like 2018, I think it was. I know this is oddly specific that I remember, but and I I thought, oh, this is still in good shape because it used to be where we. We would go in the early 2000s to you could get everything there right and then i went into one in um to the end of 2019 and i was like this place is not yeah. doing so you hot. could tell it was falling apart around the edges like the quality of mm -hmm. the merchandise maybe just the presentation of the store everything was kind of falling a little bit huh? yeah and they had like nobody working i think there was like two people i saw in the whole entire store whereas i mean it's a huge store right you know and stuff was not stocked right it was kind of like you could tell that there, there were issues, but I would imagine that COVID probably helped drive that mm -hmm. nail in the coffin. And yeah. And also it was just time. I mean, a lot of the stuff you can buy online. Right. Okay. So that, and then, um, you know, the community banks, people are still kind of saying that that could be an issue. And since a lot of places get their funding for like the real estate projects, like local ones, if those banks are tightening up and feeling that kind of like pinch, you know, What's that going to look like? Mm -hmm. And for local developers, that might be an issue. And then um, the last thing is just that a lot of people also get it from like venture capital money, all this kind of stuff. It doesn't really affect real estate as much in the sense of like, I mean, in certain aspects that that they're kind of feeling iffy about it. I don't know. It, there's been nothing that's been like, oh, my gosh, you know, this huge lender. Oh, and then there's that talk about the real estate loans, like how if you have good credit, I'm not going to get into that because it's like mm -hmm. there's a lot of misinformation out there right. about it. People yeah. are skewing it towards their agendas, but right. You know, both so, sides. Right. You know, and I mean, obviously, like if you look at it, it just says, hey, if you have good credit, you're going to pay more. That's going to mm -hmm. piss off a lot of people. Right. right? Like, so I'm going to work really hard and I have to pay more. Mm -hmm. But that's, which is not the case. Yeah. No, exactly. So it's like you got to be careful when you're when you're reading things that you're reading the whole thing. Mm -hmm. And then you also see what happens. So. Yeah. Yeah. Not just falling into someone else's agenda. Right. Which is easy to do, because right. like, if, if I told you that headline, you'd be pissed, wouldn't you? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, yeah. like, that's not fair. But that's then fair. so real estate wise, I don't know. What are you seeing? Like, are you f seeing any? I mean, each market is different. Mm -hmm. So we're in a lot of different markets. So I notice things changing in certain markets. Uh, other markets are actually some markets are actually picking up steam, believe it or not. You know, they're actually getting oh, busier. Oh, I believe than it. it. Yes. OK. <laughs> so some markets are actually getting busier, believe mm -hmm. it or not. So again, I believe it. We <laughs> I think I just day. have to say, believe it or not, a lot. So anyhow, <laughs> <laughs> so it's it's local. Real estate is local, and you know when you hear J.P. Morgan coming out and saying the market's at a bottom. Well, maybe it as was Morgan Stanley. Morgan Stanley. I don't know if I even remember. Is. Yeah, <laughs> whoever it is, mm -hmm. yeah, that's an aggregate, you know, for the entire country. But but each little segment of the market is different, so you just have to look at it individually. So mm -hmm. it's, it's tough to make those generalizations and get any real impactful data from it. Right. And you look know, at each area. And the housing market is different than the commercial market is different than the land market. Now, if one of them really does take a dive, it will affect everybody mm -hmm. just because 
people get scared, which right. is normal, right? right? So that's why it's good to like kind of pay attention to all of it. But also even like at the bigger projects, like the bigger pieces of land that we sell, those take longer, always do. So if I were to start getting into it right now and I say, okay, my smaller property or pieces of land sell quicker than my larger ones, but I don't really realize that. And I look at it and I'm just like, oh my gosh, this, this one that's taking so much longer to sell. I might think, oh, okay, this is taking longer to sell. All of it's taking longer to sell. And that's not the case. So you really do have to look specifically at the different types of properties, where they are before you make generalizations. Exactly. Yeah. Generalizations can sometimes be dangerous. Maybe not dangerous. Maybe that's the wrong word. Dangerous. Wow. Okay. <laughs> Deceptive, I guess. Uh huh. Right. Yeah. Because 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 the real info is in the details. I know, and that's why it's like all the news. Anytime I hear good, bad, and different, whatever, I always kind of am like, okay, let's see how this plays out, you know, and like and get you know get that information from all the different sources, which leads me to negotiations because that's the same kind of thing, really. You're looking at the big picture. Mm-hmm. I'm trying to make this work and it's not. Yeah. Well, you're trying to segue it. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> That's okay. But but first, before we get into the main oh, topic of this, uh-huh. I, I do want to mention a couple of things. If you are new to this podcast or new to land flipping, anything like that, one thing that I would love for you to do is to check out our land flipping community. Link is right below this video if you're watching it on YouTube. If you're listening to it on the podcast, just go to our website, which is turningprofit.com. You'll see numerous buttons all over this website. Join our land flipping community. And the reason I'd love for you to go over there and join is because that there is a full training program that will be released released very soon. Maybe when you're listening, this will be already wow. released. Wow. Okay. If you're listening to it weeks from now. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Ooh, okay. uh, but I'm getting close. Yes. I'm chipping away and I'm being very consistent. I'm getting very close. This is a, a free training program. And I hate to even use the word free and training program together because it's more than the typical tree free training program that you'll see online from many of these other you know, companies that, that well, are just a, a kind of a ploy to get you to buy a more expensive thing. And so. the thing is that we've sold course, I call, they were courses back then. This is a training program mm-hmm. and Pete's very specific on his terminology. So I'm trying to respect that. Just like Disneyland doesn't have rides, they have attractions. Okay. I yeah, can be trained, kind of. But um, we've sold courses that are, uh, they're amazing. They're mm-hmm. And this is the same caliber as that, it better in a different way, you know? And you made the decision to offer it at no cost. Right. See, I didn't use no the word cost. Free. I like that. Maybe so, I'll just have to start using that terminology. No that sounds a little bit better. I know. And I think because the whole thing is that you worry that if you give something away for free, people don't value it. Right. And that's cool. Maybe people won't value it. That'll be even better for the people who do realize how good it is. And they're going to be able to really, you mm-hmm. know, take off with their business. I don't care. Yeah. I and don't that's care. That's a funny either. thing. No, I mean, it's not like I don't care. It's that I actually prefer this because then it's not like it's going to be the people that are going to go through the whole thing are the serious ones. Yeah. You know, and then that'll make more time for us to help them as opposed to people who will never do anything with it, which is another rant where, you know, it's like you talk about and I'm I fall victim to that. Do you know how many things I've bought over the years or, you know, like educational products and how many have I actually done? I don't know. I don't know. I need you to know because I don't know. (laughs) That's the that's the problem. Probably half of them. And I would hate for people to have wasted their time on me. But it's because I needed the ones that click. Right. And so it's like we're intentionally focusing on the people that really like, I don't want to say a bad, this was like, I was going to say something that was like a bad thing. Um, not a bad thing, just inappropriate, I guess. Like a swear word. No, Heather? like oh. a saying that like, um, you know, just do it. Uh-huh. Don't. Okay. I'm not following. Just but... do it. Let's okay. just say that. Just do it. I think, I think that's someone else's it's trademarked. I know or thing, something. But Sorry about that. <laughs> Also in the community, too, which I think... Oh, I'm sorry. Were we talking about something? Yeah, I don't even know. We got off (laughs) track here. Also in the community, I've been doing these weekly Zoom calls. Oh, yes. Where people can, if people are interested in land flipping and they generate a deal, basically what I'm doing is I'm going through live and I'm evaluating these deals. Like, what are the things I look at to determine Mm -hmm. if a property is a deal or not? what What the thing is worth? So I go through that live so you get to see my whole process. And... To be honest, if you're going to get into this land flipping business, that's the one thing that I would really hone in on the beginning. You have to be able to determine what are these properties worth? What's a good property? What's a bad property? What's a deal? You need to be, need to be able to recognize a deal because it all starts there. And sometimes someone could skew something and you could look at things in a certain way and think, hey, that's a deal. But in reality, it's not. So my goal is to really show people how to evaluate these properties. And once you can figure that part out, 
it's like cracking the code. Like you have, you have really, uh, you've become more powerful in this business in the, in the fact that you, you know what a deal is, you're confident and you can go ahead and, and take advantage of it when that deal presents itself. To be honest. Okay. <laughs> I know you hate when I say that, you know, to be honest, but <laughs> it just comes out sometimes. I'm always honest, but I know that's what's so funny to me, to be honest. Yes. So to be honest with you, you do not have to have a deal to submit to um, listen to these. Oh, no, no. Most people don't. Most people are logging into the Zoom call and they're just learning. In fact, that's how I learned really how to do this. I mean, I had I have had a wealth of experience with single family homes and lots of different forms of real estate, but not land. I didn't know how to evaluate land specifically for this business model. And what I did was I was just listening to other people doing these deal breakdown calls like this, and I learned how to do it myself. And it made sense. So I'm trying to pass that on so other people can learn as well. And honestly, there's no cost. <laughs> to be honest, Heather, I'm <laughs> not really happy with this discussion. You're getting uncomfortable. Yes. This is awesome. Yeah. So they're posted. So if you wanted to find when they are and how to get onto them, go to a turning profit mm -hmm. or the button that's down below. Right. And then it's posted in our group um, community. Community. Thank you. See, I'm, I'm really um, struggling today, honestly. And there once a week, you don't have to submit a deal. So other people will submit deals. But if you have a, a deal that you, you know, want Pete to hash through, you can listen in on that. It's or view it. Actually, it's on video, too, right? It is. Yeah. Video. So we uh, do them live. We've been doing them once a week. It's supposed to be an hour, but they've been up being two hours each. So if you can make it live, great. If there's a calendar in the community. You'll see when those are going to be happening. And then if you can't make it live, we also then post the recordings as well. And those are good to kind of binge watch instead of watching some new show on Netflix or something like that. That's rude. <laughs> that last one, and um, we had to go somewhere and I, I was like behind the screen. I'm like, you cannot take any more deals. Like, I'm like, we have to like out of here. So, um, and our daughter, our oldest helps moderate. Yes. Yeah, she's kind of my co-host on these. She is. Right. Yeah. She's like awesome. And she loves real estate too, as does our, our middle daughter, maybe mm -hmm. the youngest, but she's 13. So. Right. Um, yeah. well, well, maybe see. one of these days. She yeah. likes money. So I could see She that. does like money. Yeah. yeah spending it. Yes, and she likes fake um, internet funny money stuff like oh. star coins mm -hmm. and Robux. You know, if you have young kids, you know, you probably know what I'm talking about. She is rich <laughs> <laughs> in uh, star coins. Well, this one, yeah. yeah, that game Star Stables is uh, what she Star Stable. You know. Oh, yeah. I know. You know, <laughs> I'm, I'm getting continuous requests from her. I need more star coins. It's double star coin weekend, and she knows how to sell it. She right. negotiates with you, right? She does. She's good, and then she buys all these horses on there and then she she got this stable of all these different it's amazing but anyhow you know what though um, i think it's funny because that's it, it she has learned that like it brings her joy to have these things and that she has to work for it so it's like okay what can i do to pay i need mm -hmm. this much money what can i do to pay for it right and i'm like well yeah. yeah she she has certain things that she's responsible for doing um and then we sometimes have other tasks outside for that if she needs more money and then she gets a an allowance as well what is her number one negotiation skill to get you to do it? Because she doesn't ask me because I say no. Like, it's not even a question. I'll be like, no, no, hmm. we're not doing it. Her w number one negotiation tactic? With you. I don't even know. She doesn't give up. Oh, persistence. Uh -huh. Yes. Oh, my gosh. She's like, I could appreciate that. See, my parents always See, taught me. Why. <laughs> my parents always taught me that it was rude to be persistent like that. Mm -hmm. So I'm kind of always internally struggling with that. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't want to be too persistent because I'm, I don't want to come off as rude. Mm -hmm. But she doesn't have that at all. No, she does not have a sense of that whatsoever. No, not at all. It's great. I would mm -hmm. love to be like that. Mm -hmm. but don't care. Right. And that's her negotiation. Like, mm -hmm. she'll come to you with some sort of, like, she thinks it's a win-win and you'll be like, uh, I don't think so or something. And then she'll walk off. Then she'll come with another variation of it. Right. And then another variation. So she's negoti She's actually using your negotiation skills because I do see it. But her top one is that she she can go days yeah right yeah she weeks. is yeah. she like will not she's stop. really good uh, yeah. and she doesn't get upset she doesn't she sees it as like okay well i just need to go back to the drawing i need table. to take more inspiration from that i really do it's okay yeah. yeah man I, or you could just be like me and like she knows it's not going to work so it doesn't matter regardless right, you're the tougher one and i don't know why how even, did i become i don't even why parent. you get asked sometimes some of these things i know i'll like, look at her i'm she like she should like skip going to you because she does because then if you say no then it makes it harder on me because then i have to you know mm -hmm. no, you're, have then, to, you're then i have to negotiate with, with you and just say hey i really think she should do this and then you know are you okay with this yeah, and then I've pretty much given up. So, um, <laughs> so yeah, but it's a good segue to negotiations because um, 
I th- well, and actually, we just talked about this because I'm actually looking at a list that you created, mm-hmm. and your top tip is always counter an offer, and that's exactly what she does. Mm-hmm. Yeah, like she, she does. Always does that. She takes it back, and she's like, "Okay, um, they said no, but maybe they would do it this way." Like, but in land, if someone's like a flat out no, are you going to go back to them? Like, okay, let's say you you send a letter to somebody, right, right. and then they, you offer them X amount of dollars, and they say they call in and they're like hey we don't want to sell and then the next question is always like is it a price or whatever and they're like no we're actually building a house on this we've actually got the construction loan ready to go we're just waiting for the material to drop you're not going to be like no a situation like that just simply not going to work right but but, you know in a situation though like and i i meant that tip really from the you know there's a couple different sides you can use it from but say someone thank you for covering for me on that one say someone (laughs) responds to our letter Mm -hmm. And we offered them twenty thousand dollars for a property. They come back and say, "Well, I want to sell, but it's going to take thirty thousand mm-hmm. So in this situation, we would probably come back and say, "You know, we can come up to twenty two thousand if we put the deal together here's here's why we can't come up to thirty thousand mm-hmm. but and it's only if you really if the numbers if still will, work if it's the numbers not still like, work. yes definitely, yeah, definitely and then from the se- selling side as well uh I always use that tactic. So say a, you know, we sell our properties through real estate agents. So the real estate agents will kind of collect those offers, whether it's from a buyer directly or from another agent. And then they send them to me to evaluate the deal. Mm -hmm. And we'll look at it and say, it's the same property that we bought for 20,000. And the offer was 40,000 or something like that. We had it listed for 49.9, maybe Mm -hmm. something like that. So in that situation, I would evaluate, look at the numbers, see what made sense, and say I loved everything about the offer. You know, I'm like, okay, that's good. Everything will work on it. But I always counter at least something Mm -hmm. because you never want to accept, just accept an offer right off the bat. So because then the buyers will think, well, they offer too too much. Yeah. It's a psychological thing, but it's it's seriously, Mm -hmm. you know, like I've been on that other side as a buyer and I think, wait a second, they just accepted it without countering like I, I must have i must have messed up and it offer triggers too buyer's high. remorse it triggers buyer's remorse that's yeah. a great way to put it so i always counter something even if it's simple like say for instance they offered a 45 day close i might go back and say hey everything looks great but if we can do 30 days mm-hmm. you know I, I would move forward on it so Knowing that even if it, it took 45 right. days it's not like you're right gonna... and and even if they come back and say well 45 days is the quickest we would close it and then I would hem in a hole and say, okay, we'll do it. But mm-hmm. at, at least you got to push back on something because uh, you'll find that deals stick better that way. Now, the other thing about that is too, so say it's about the price. Mm-hmm. You know, say, you know, someone uh, offered 40000 on a 49.9 listing. We might go back and say, okay, um, we're, we're, we're interested in selling, but we got to be at 47 or something like that. You know, we'll pick a number to try to push back a little bit, to try to bump up the price a little bit. And you'd be surprised how often you can get them to come up from what you would have accepted. Right, so. and I think these are, like these kind of numbers, you're not, it's not like a $2 million home and you're asking for $250,000 more. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like normally they have $2,000 more if mm-hmm. they're gonna be doing this because they're gonna use the project or you know complete something else with it. And I think it, part of me thinks, boy, this really sucks that you have to do this because it is kind of a mind game. But we actually have tried just accepting offers Mm -hmm. and they fall out more. Yeah, they do. You know, or people feel like they need to get some sort of renegotiation over something Mm -hmm. where it's they need to feel like, okay, we we got something special. We were able to get this property. It was, you know, a value and we got a good deal because they actually wanted more. Mm -hmm. And it's not just even get letting them have a discount off the uh, offer price. It's that second little the yeah. whole thing. Do you think most of the, our agents are kind of like trained that we do that now? Yeah, yeah. Most of them know how we do how we do it. You so know? they'll figure it out. Like, hey, mm-hmm. should we go back it? Yeah, and and if they don't, if they're new working with us, I, mm-hmm. I, you know, let them in on my philosophy. Like, hey, mm-hmm. I like this offer. I like everything about it, but I can't just accept. I can't it. just accept it because because of this. So we always go back and say, hey, go back to them and, and see if they'll do thirty days. Mm-hmm. I don't say thirty days or, or it. I'm not doing it. You know. I right. <laughs> because even if they say no, they still had that kind of t- like they almost lost it. Right. So they're feeling special that they got exactly. it. Exactly. OK, that makes sense. This next one you have is if you have multiple offers, always request highest and best from all parties. Now, that was big during the recession selling. Mm-hmm. Like that's what's 
kind of crazy too, that you would think in a market where it was like what people considered a down real estate market, there was still highest and best. Yeah, there was a frenzy of buyers actually right. during that time. Uh-huh. So most of the properties that I sold as an REO listing mm-hmm. broker, there I would get into this situation where as a seller, there would be more buyers than actually uh, the property to sell. There's mm-hmm. one property and you've got many people that want to buy it. So what happens is when you're doing this, when I mentioned highest and best, you go back to anyone that submitted an offer and you say, hey, let us know your highest and best and, and we'll evaluate it from there. So using that property, 49.9, say you got three offers on it. One of them was 40, one was 45, and one was 49.9 at listing price. So you could easily just say, oh, I'm going to take the one at listing price and that's good for me and we'll be good to go. But if you go back to all of them and you say, okay, the seller, you know, you're requesting highest and best. You tell them we have multiple offers. Yeah, you're telling the agent to, mm-hmm. to then go and let everyone know that we have multiple offers submit your highest and best offer by this time, this date and this time, and then we'll go from there. So then what may happen is one may say, oh, I'm staying at the same price, staying at 40,000. Other one may say, okay, I'll go up to 47. The one at 49.9, they may really, really want the property and they'll come back and say, okay, I'll do it at 60. Mm -hmm. This has happened many times. So I was in my head, I was thinking 59.9 and you're like 60, but that's what, yeah. So this has happened many times. Mm -hmm. And then obviously at that point, um, we have the option to then just accept which off, whatever offer we want, mm-hmm. or we could go back to one of those offers and say, Hey, I like the price and everything, but if you change this ter- term, I would go for it with you. Mm-hmm. So you've got mul- multiple options at that point, but you don't want to just sell yourself short kind of just by moving ahead with the best offer that initially comes in. You always want to go back and, and see what they come back at. Right. And, and you'd be there. surprised too. Some of them might say, okay, well, I can't come up as much, but I can close in two days. Right. I mean, not two days. That would be weird. But I mean, that, well, yeah. maybe, maybe if your escrow company could do that. Okay. And then your next one is actually a quote from Chris Voss. Well, it's a book. <laughs> is the book called Chris Voss? No, Chris Voss is the author. So it's called Never Split the Difference. Oh my gosh. <laughs> I thought you were just, just writing a quote there. Never split the difference. But yes. yeah. Now why? Well, Chris Voss was a FBI negotiator. He was their lead negotiator. I listened to the audiobook. It's a very good, very good <laughs> book. If you're into negotiation, these types of things, he, he has lots of good tactics. I mean, you never know when you're going to need to negotiate but, with a terrorist. <laughs> but his main concept, never split the difference. <laughs> never split the difference. Or a three-year-old. Is, right. It's very applicable to real estate, too. So I know it's typical if you're trying to work out a deal with someone, using that same example, you know, say someone offers $40,000 on your property that you have listed for forty nine nine, mm-hmm. essentially 50000 So it would be in most people's kind of DNA to go back and say, okay, let's split the difference. Let's, let's go at forty five, and then let's put the deal together there. And yes, that, that may work, but you're probably selling yourself a little bit short too. So his concept is that you go back and you may go back and say, well, um, I can come down to 48, maybe, and mm-hmm. then see where they see where you can go from there. But, you know, one of his lines is, now how am I supposed to do that? You know, it, and you can't really have direct contact with some mm-hmm. of these, you know, buyers and things because you're working through agents and everything like that. But I just think it's interesting. You just kind of put yourself in a position like, hey, I, I want to put together a deal, but but how am I supposed to make that happen? You know, so in this case, you'd probably want to go back and and do something like 48,000 instead of, you know, the standard 45,000. And you'll be surprised that you'll end up in a lot better position a lot of times. Yeah, it's so. kind of like that thing where it's like, don't negotiate with yourself. Mm-hmm. Right. Like, you know, you would wait for them to come back instead of you don't you don't, you know, like, Get the answer before you say, okay, I can go down another 2000 or something. Mm. I think it's funny though, because when we buy things, a lot of times we'll be like, okay, we want to get it for Mm 45,000. Like just on the, on our side, I know that we do that where we'll say, okay, so it's listed at 50. We want it for 45. We'll offer 40. And we know that they'll come back at 45 and they always come back at 45 and we would like, we would go higher, Mm -hmm. but, but we know the psychology on the opposite way. So we do split, like we use that to our advantage. But then we also use it to our advantage on the right. other side. But, it, but even if they come back at 45, then we'd probably say, well, I mean, I can come up two grand to 42. Right. 
<laughs> but you know what I mean? I, oh, right. Like, oh yeah, perfect examples like car buying, like negotiating and stuff right. like that. Or just being like, my favorite other thing to do, which again, you can't be there, is not to say anything. Mm-hmm. Like, right. oh. Yeah. <laughs> or. Huh. And then they're like, uh, okay, what about, you know, and it's yeah. like, okay. Yeah. Okay, that's fun. Yeah. Um, okay, so then I'm going to actually pull this because. Let's see here. Respond to offers quickly. Strike while the iron is hot. Yes. A thousand times yes. That is the most frustrating thing. Mm, I think it's in Southern California. Yes. People are trying to be too cool sometimes, Mm -hmm. I think. And when we get an offer in, I always make it a point to respond as quickly as we can. I don't sleep on them. The goal is to sell it, right? right? That's right. So so why are you going to, you know, slow play? Unless you're unless you're Mm -hmm. waiting for multiple offers Mm -hmm. to come in or something like that, if you've got an indication that may happen. But that's Generally, like a stall technique. Oh, right. I almost ate my uh, yeah. microphone. That's like we would be intentionally stalling. Right. Which, again, exactly. we don't like to play games, but sometimes if you know another offer's coming yeah. in. Yeah, and, and then in that case, you know, you could have your agent inform the other agent or the buyer that, hey, we've got an indication that multiple offers are coming in, and that's why we're not responding right away. Mm-hmm. You know, we, we appreciate you submitting your offer. We will get back to you very shortly, but this, this is the situation. So it's always been my thing that, you have to respond to these offers quickly if you want to put together deals with these people. Because when people write that offer, that's when they're most excited. Mm-hmm. And if you are going to wait a certain amount of time, say you wait three days to get back to them. They've got that written into their offer. Mm-hmm. You can get back to them in three days. But and, that's just like standard. Yeah. That's not really them saying we... Right. It's know. standard verbiage written mm-hmm. to a lot of offers. But you're giving them an opportunity to have buyer's remorse before they've even gotten to that point. And they, they're still looking around. And they're thinking, oh, what is this? I don't want it. This guy is a jerk. You know, he's not responding to me. I mean, they build up all kinds of things in their mind. Mm-hmm. And you'll just find it. You'll have a lot more success and you'll be able to put together a lot more deals if you just make a decision quickly and, and respond to them. And then you see where it goes. Yeah. And the thing, know? too, is if it's not going to happen, like if they're going to bail during escrow, I'd much rather get it started sooner rather than stretch it out mm-hmm. and then stretch it out again. Like these people that aren't truly committed won't be committed right you know what i mean like yeah yeah i agree i think it's just the right thing to do to like Mm -hmm. keep it going but you have to respond you put a lot more deals together that way trust me Mm -hmm. don't be greedy don't be greedy yeah i mean i think sometimes do you do i think sometimes (laughs) she said i think gosh it's just like you're setting yourself up for these ones honestly (laughs) honestly heather i do think sometimes every once in a while i do think (laughs) But don't be greedy. Why? Yeah, because I think sometimes, here I said it again, I think sometimes. <laughs> I say that kind of thing all the time, and uh, maybe I should be more aware it's of fine. what That's I what say. That's what I'm here for. Filler words, I guess you could say. Mm-hmm. A lot of deals will fall apart if you're getting too greedy. You know, like you understand that the people want the deal. You know, may- maybe you push things a little bit too far, mm-hmm. you know, as far as price and things go. And uh, a lot of times a fair deal is better than one that's too skewed towards you. So that's kind of the way I look at it. And that happens a lot from the the buyer side as well. You know, when we're looking to buy a property, if um, I don't, even if I sense that someone's in a position where they really need to sell this property or something like that, and obviously I want to buy it for the best possible price, but I'm not pushing it to the point where where, where I'm being greedy. I, I give them something which I consider fair, which I know we're going to be able to make money on, but I'm not going to uh, try to, you know, do something that's, I don't know, that I can't live with myself. You know what I mean? Right. And so. and if you're just looking at it in a strictly business sense, if you push it too far and then they feel that they got taken advantage of, mm-hmm. are they going to refer other people or if they have other pieces of land, would they sell them to you? No. Like you're, you're not, you're thinking of like right the second, but you're not thinking in the big picture. That's right. So we do try to be balanced on mm-hmm. that and be fair and make sure that both sides are happy. We have to make money right? or we can't do it. That's right. Then we couldn't do it at all. Right. And they should get a fair amount. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Don't get emotional. It's simply a business negotiation. And that is another big. Yes. Yeah. It's Mm -hmm. business. You know, these are numbers. You're buying and selling properties. It's about the numbers. It's not about any sort of relationships or any sort of potential slight that you perceived from from the other side. None of that stuff matters. It's just about the numbers. It's about the deal. Are they going to get it done in a certain amount Mm -hmm. of time? Are you going to get the price that you want? Or. You know, it's it's just that. It's nothing else. So when you remove all that other stuff from the equation, negotiation, business, putting together deals is so much easier. 
Right. Do the numbers it just work? Matter. Like that for stuff doesn't them, matter. For them, doesn't do the numbers work for you? Right. I know, and and a lot of times that the, you have to go into it. The people that are selling it to us, some of them have no emotional tie to this. They don't care at all. Mm-hmm. Some of them, maybe there is, you know, they they want to sell, but it was, you know, Mima and Papa's place five thousand years ago. That is emotional. Mm-hmm. So you can be respectful of it, but still not be skewed either way. Right. By that. And then also someone buying it again, the same kind of thing. It could be a transactional thing for them, or it could be that they're going to be building their dream home on it. And so they're already feeling an emotional attachment. Their reactions and their interaction with you has nothing to do with your interaction to them. Right. So. You know, a typical place where I see emotions get involved is when there are delays and delays mm-hmm. are just, that's part of the real estate doing right. real estate deals. They're, you know, and as a buyer and as a seller, I generally want to get things done as quickly as possible. But sometimes things take longer than they want them to. Mm-hmm. Maybe the title search takes longer than I want it to. Maybe on this this sales side, you know, the the attorney or title company is not getting things done as quickly as I'd want them to. And and when things get delayed, people get emotional and it's just not productive. So it's best to take a step back from those situations, kind of evaluate and restate what your goal is mm-hmm. and the fact that you just want to get things done. You want to get it done as quickly and efficiently as possible, but there's no really room or need to lash back out at the other side or make them pay for something they said or did. You know, none of that stuff matters. It no. doesn't matter. No, and no one's intentionally trying to screw someone over. Yeah, I in mean, most cases. Most, yeah, I know. There's sometimes, and but then that's also something you need to look at. Mm-hmm. Is this person intentionally trying to, you know, whatever? And if that's the case, and don't extend the escrow. Right. Like if you tell if if you can tell they're just messing around with you or whatever, mm-hmm. get out. It's not you yeah, know it's, it's business. a business. Sorry, this isn't happening. But if everyone's putting forth a good faith effort, yep, it, you're not going to care. Right. It, I think that saying is that um, if you won't care in a year, stop caring today. Or you know what I mean. Yeah, whatever that's it a good, is, that's a good way to put it. Really, I mean, you think about a lot of these things that maybe deals you were in or things that upset you a while back. I mean, those things don't they don't. They don't impact your life. I mean, maybe you think about it every once in a while, but if you think about what was your reaction to that situation, a lot of times your reaction to that situation was worse than the actual situation. Well, it's just probably what you're upset about. Mm -hmm. Your reaction. Yeah. Yeah. I I do the whole thing where I can look back and I remember how I feel, but normally I can't remember what even happened. Yeah. What what were the details? And Uh you know, that happens all the time with different things. I'm like, hey, what what even happened with that? And you remember a lot of those things Mm -hmm. more than I do. And I'm like, oh, yeah right i don't care (laughs) life is truly too short to really care about and the goal is to run a business all right okay try to shorten the closing timeline where appropriate yeah Mm, i mean because less things can go wrong but that's funny that you exactly you know and i always do that generally on any offer Mm. that we get you know as long as if it reasonably can possibly be done shorter this is one more selling properties generally Mm. so i oh you know a lot of offers will come in 60 day closing or something like that so We'll always go back and say, hey, can you do it in 30 days? Mm -hmm. You know, I always like to get things done quicker, especially in this business, because it's about the velocity of the money. So how fast can you keep that money moving? Mm -hmm. And it's always worth asking. You know, they may say, oh, I can't for this reason or that reason or whatever, but it doesn't hurt to ask. And then, you know, if they can't close it quicker, then you have to decide, does that time frame work for you or not? Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. I mean, it never hurts to ask. And then you said never paint yourself in a corner. Mm, Yeah, I like this one. I always talk about this. Never paint yourself in a corner. Now, when you're using agents, you know, you're selling a property, um, you're using agents to kind of be your mouthpiece and do your negotiating for you. You know, you kind of have to get on the same page with them and make sure that they're using the proper, you know, techniques in a way with your negotiation. But, you know, if someone, let's go back to that 49.9 property. Someone offered you 40,000. And say we went back and said 48,000, right? I wouldn't phrase it in a way that said, you know, I need 48,000 or this deal, or I'm not going to do this deal. Mm -hmm. You know, that's painting yourself in the corner. That's just giving like an ultimatum in a way. And yes, you could always change your mind and get back out of it, but I don't like doing that. You know, I want to say things in a way that gives some room and some flexibility when there is potentially a little flexibility. You know, you could you could just state your case and say, hey, we've had a lot of interest on this property. You know, I I wouldn't doubt if we're able to get full price for this. Uh, mm-hmm. So, you know, the seller, they came back at 48. Um, seems like you have a strong offer and we'd love to put something together. You know, th- that's kind of like negotiating 
but it's not saying, well, they need 48, you know, in order to make this deal work. And then these people might have thought in their mind, like, well, I'm maxed out at 45. It's not even worth it. Or, you know, I whatever the case. I shouldn't even tell them that. Because, right. Yeah, I shouldn't even offer 45 because right. 48's it. Right, exactly. So I just think of it that way in all forms of negotiation. I never try to give ultimatums unless it actually is a real mm-hmm. ultimatum. Like, hey, you know, 48 is the absolute lowest I can go for this property. Then we would communicate that position. Uh, we're already in the corner on it. And if that works, it, it works. If it doesn't, it doesn't. So Right. And you're at that point, you're ready to actually walk away right, from negotiations. Exactly. I like, am in the corner. I'm, I'm you know, that's uh-huh, it. You're done with it. Right. And you have, it's exhausted it and it's just not going to work. And if it right. does, great. But at this point, you're like, I, right. I need to not do this anymore. Right. Yeah, I think that's a good one. Okay. So keep some thoughts to yourself. Some agents may share information you've provided confidential. Confidentially. Yes, that that does happen. Or they might use your. Oh, what was this again? Oh, I did... even forgot what I wrote. <laughs> Keep some thoughts to yourself. Yeah, some agents may uh-huh. share information you provide. Did I even say it? Or was I just like you thinking did. in my you head? You did. Like... It just, I have to see it on paper sometimes to <laughs> process like, it. Oh, yes, that's. <laughs> yeah, so you kind of got to gauge who you're working with as far as an agent or broker, you know, as far as someone that's selling a property on on your behalf Mm -hmm. sometimes you know you just need to make sure you have a good relationship before you share all information with them and you know you don't want to communicate some confidential information to them if you feel like maybe they're not 100 percent on your side you know if you you get that feeling or whatever you know it's not i'm not saying there's anything you know like devious yeah devious going on or anything like that but you know, especially if it's a situation where maybe you're new working with this agent and they're bringing the buyer as well, mm-hmm. then you just kind of got to, got to, I don't know, well, maybe use, maybe hold back everything. Yeah. <laughs> Using that same thing that you just did, mm-hmm. right? Like during that negotiation, let's say the agent learns that your bottom line's 48,000. Mm-hmm. You know, that's one thing if the, if they go into this next one and, some, and they ha- they're dealing with someone else, a different agent, they're like, well, I know like their people are like, hey, is there any way that they would take 35? Mm-hmm. And they're like, no, we were in negotiations and I think their bottom line was 48,000. Mm-hmm. Okay, now, if you had told them up front, like, hey, I want to get $48,000 for this, like that's going to be the gold price. Like, mm-hmm. We're going to list it at 60, but I really want to get, I have to get at least 48,000. Mm-hmm. And then they bring a buyer and they're the first person that's looking at it. It's just listed. They could conceivably say to them, yeah, it's 60 and they'd be like, oh, I really want to get it less. Well, he he told me up front that he wanted 48,000. But these people might have paid 55. Right. So in th- that's what you're looking at. You know, if it comes out at the end of negotiations and that they use it in a, a way that's not, you know. Right. And, and even if these people aren't trying to be like malicious. Right. They're just trying to put a deal together. Exactly. Yeah. And you can't fault them except for that they need to be a mature enough a negotiator to understand when to pull that out. Mm-hmm. And if someone's coming to them right off the bat at a 60,000, even though they know 48,000 because you confidentially told them that. And maybe it is. It's helpful to say, hey, this is just between you and I. Please don't use this. Mm hmm. They right. might still, but maybe right. that which because they might not even realize what they're doing. They're thinking, oh, OK, well, their goal is 48. I'll get this together and then they'll bring you the offer for 48,000. Right. right. Exactly. Yeah. It's, it, so you just you just be a little cautious, you know, mm-hmm. when you're dealing with someone new, especially or maybe the dual representation type thing. Mm-hmm. Sometimes just be aware of that. And maybe in certain situations, you keep some of that more confidential, like in your internal numbers and things like a little closer to the vest. No. Um, okay, well, that's it for that segment, I think. Oh, okay. I know. You had you printed something out, but I think you didn't mean to print that. You had like copy and pasted something extra on there oh, that had okay. something to do with you this. You don't want to so. share that? No. I was like, I don't. I'm like, that doesn't even you know, look like a question. Quick reminder, all mm-hmm. these tips and there's are going to be in the land flipping training program, which will be released soon. Lots, mo- lots more different things like this, but Very this good. is just one little tiny piece of it that we picked out. Lovely. Okay. Lovely explanation. Okay. So we've got a little bit of time here. Um, questions. Yes. So, so these questions the are from our community. Yeah. Yes. Heine says, okay, I'm trying to, looking for recommendations on mistakes to avoid on your first mailer. Planning to send out my first mailer in May first week. Hmm, okay. Yes. Yeah, so this is a question we actually get quite frequently because people obviously want their first mailer. You know, we generate all of our business with direct mail. So it's very important to to actually send out mail that hopefully is going to be generating you some leads. So there's a lot that goes into it, which we'll cover extensively in the training program. So it's hard for me to give all those tips in Just give here. one, like what is the biggest one? What is the like? Yeah, I would focus on an area where there's actual sales happening. You know, so 
obviously there's parts of this country that are very, very sparsely populated. And it may be appealing to think, you know, there's tons of land in these areas, but there's no transactions happening. So you don't want to be sending out and prospecting to these areas because it's kind of hard to resell the properties after you buy it. Maybe easy to buy, maybe easy to buy in some of mm-hmm. these areas, but and for a cheap price. But if you've got no buyers on the other side, then it, the kind of business model falls apart. Right. It'd be an uphill battle. It'd be an uphill battle. Okay. So yeah. right off the top, you want to go for places that have a lot of activity. Right. And, you know, and there's a balance too. you know, like some areas are really good. They've got decent activity and they're not like the super active areas. So some of those decent activities are some of the better areas really to prospect because they're, you know, less competition in those areas. You can get pretty good discounts on the properties you buy. And there's actually buyers on the other side that are looking to acquire properties as well. So it's kind of, kind of a win-win. So the other thing that's a, another big tip is not to price too low. You know, I know there's this tendency, you want to buy these properties as cheap as you possibly can. Uh, so I see people, and I did this, I talked about this before, like my first mail where I sent out 10,000 pieces of mail and I did 25% of market value in a super hot area. And that's just not a match. You know, I probably should have done 50%. And that still would have been tough to get a deal in that area. Mm -hmm. So they looked at my offers and just threw them right in the trash or used them for another purpose. I don't know. (laughs) Toilet paper? (laughs) I don't know. I I mean, that's uh, innovative use, Heather, but uh, (laughs) who knows what they used it for. (laughs) That's that's awesome. Okay. Janesta says, beginner's question, can this be done working a full-time job and where do I start? Hi, happy to be here. I work a full-time job as a receptionist. I'm going to be retiring at the end of the year and I want to uh, pick up a new skill. I've researched wholesaling single family homes and heard that that's very saturated. And so I decided I want to learn how to wholesale land. I've never done anything like this before and I have not gotten a course on how to get started. So I'm hoping I can learn something from this group. My question is, where do I start? And can this be done if I work full-time? Take it away. Yeah. So one thing I want to point out, she mentioned wholesaling land. It's not really what we do, but maybe this is what she's thinking that we do. Oh yeah, do. maybe, maybe Yeah, she... so wholesale would be like you generate a deal off market mm-hmm. and then you sell it to another investor. And who a lot then of ta- would sell it or Yeah, who it. then retail it or something mm-hmm. like that. So I guess m- the model is more like wholetailing, they call it. You know, it's kind of like a hybrid word. So you buy a property off market uh-huh. and then you sell it on market, but you sell it at a price that's a price that's a- aggressive and it's going to get a and buyer And what is this pretty- called? Wholetailing. I, you know, I've heard that term for, thrown around and I, and I don't, uh, some people do that with houses. Mm-hmm. They'll just buy, you know, especially when the market was really super heated up, they mm-hmm. would buy a property directly from, uh, you know, someone that they generated, you know, with direct mail or something like that. And then they just did a trash out on the property or something like that, get it completely vacant. And then mm-hmm. they put it on the MLS and then investors would find it there. So mm-hmm. they were able to get a higher spread. So, so instead of just selling it directly to like their pocket flipper, mm-hmm. they're putting it on the market so that it has more. Gets okay. as much exposure as it can. Yeah. Okay. So I wonder if she do- doesn't mean that though. I wonder if yeah, she Yeah, I, I don't think she saying. does. Like our model is buying off market and selling on market. Mm-hmm. So that's what we do. And, you know, there's really not much extra work in selling it on market because we use agents to resell the properties for us. But her main question was about, is this a business model that can be done while you have a full-time job? Mm-hmm. And yes, 100%, it can be done. And many people, many people do it in that way. You've told me about a few that are in the military that do it. Yeah, yeah. One one of the guys like, that's in, I, I'm in a mastermind group and mm-hmm. he, well, he's like, a, you know, um, captain in the, in the army, I believe. And he's, you know, overseas and everything. And he's got this whole land business and he's. He's doing that while he's yeah, while he's in the military and stuff and I mean, making great like money. So beyond full time. So yeah, he can definitely. do it. Yeah. Yeah. And then you also talked about someone who does it seasonally. Right. So even if you let's say it's just you're busy, I guess if you were in accounting, let's say maybe April's too much for you or whatever, mm-hmm. like it's too busy, you could do seasonally. But I think you could definitely do it full time. Right. I'm with yeah, a full time job. Yeah, you definitely can. You just have to dedicate time to it. Right. You know? So obviously it's not something that's just going to happen on mm-hmm. its own. You need to dedicate a certain time. So instead of coming home and watching Netflix. Can you please stop attacking my Netflix? Okay. Who will? Uh, please stop attacking that. Okay. Anyhow, uh-huh. you just have to make this decision like, hey, at least for right now, while I'm getting this thing up and going, I'm going to have to dedicate some time. You know, I'm going to have to pull from some other time. Like maybe it's your entertainment time. Maybe it's, <laughs> I don't know. Maybe it's the time you do something else and. 
but you, you've got to find the time somewhere. Mm-hmm. So you've got to just block off some time, devote it to this. And then, um, yeah, you can definitely make it happen. It's not easy. You know, things that are worthwhile generally in this world are not, not easy. But uh, in order to in order to get ahead, you really need to to make some of those tough decisions. And so. I think what you're saying to to reiterate is that in the beginning, it's the most labor time intense. Mm, yes. I mean, and that's just setting it up, but also learning how to do it. And then at that point, you can put whatever effort you want to put into it based off the results you want to get. Yeah. And the cool thing is, too, that you can hire assistants and things to kind of help you with some of the time consuming type tasks that mm-hmm. maybe maybe not even that difficult, but are t- more time consuming tasks. So then you could focus on the stuff that, that really uh, produces the value. Right. Know? Okay. So that sounds fair. Definitely can be done. And a lot of people do it. And a lot of people progress past that. You know, they may have their W-2 job and they do this kind of on the side until the point where they're comfortable that like, hey, this is waking, making more than my W-2 job and I'm ready to go into this full time. Where it so, doesn't make sense to do your regular. Right. Like if job. you spend all your time doing this, you'd make so much more and have a lot more freedom with your time as well. Right. Which is, I think, kind of funny mm-hmm. because the thing is that this does take time and effort, but it could be like your time. You could be in the middle of the night for a lot of the aspects mm-hmm. if you're if that's your prime time. Okay. PJ asks data services. Which data service are you using and what are you paying? I currently use DataTree. I'm paying 500 a month for 10,000 properties looking to grow ASAP. 10 K is not enough mailers each month for our goals. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I love that the, um, the volume PJ is talking Mm -hmm. about doing more more than 10,000. And I think that's awesome. Uh, so obviously you've got a few choices when it comes to the data stuff. I think prop stream is a really good economical choice through a link that we've got. Um, you can get, I think it's like 97 a month. You get like, uh, 10,000 records $97 can, $97 a month, a month. yeah okay. you can download up to 10,000 records now, and you said our link yeah and that's going to be in the training program okay also. can they email someone right now to get it yeah if you emailed me yeah yeah should I, I give can, out your personal email reset turning so I didn't just, even know that yeah well <laughs> we don't email each other we just communicate just by scream slack. across the yeah yes. <laughs> slack. okay yeah so they can uh, email so that. yeah so we've, we've got a link where you get some special pricing mm-hmm. get some free records to download i believe through there but prop stream is really good data tree can be good like you can talk to them about doing some some higher end packages the only problem with data tree is that you've got to do a monthly commitment and a contract so, okay so you have a minimum every month yeah that you have yeah to. so they'll give you better pricing the higher you know, level that you go, the higher, more you commit to. So you can want to commit to a hundred thousand records per month. You can get that cost down quite a bit. Right. But, and then with prop stream as well, they've got add on packages. So if you want to go beyond 10,000 a month, they're very reasonable as far as adding on extra data past that as well. Okay. So well, Thank you for that. Mm-hmm. Kyle asks on evaluating counties. Hey everyone, quick question. When evaluating a county to mail, uh, you look at activities versus solds over the last 12 months. Some people are also looking at solds over the last 90 days to see more recent activity. My question is, are you looking at activity slash solds using the same criteria for land you're targeting, question mark? Or are you just looking at the overall activity for the land market in a given area, i.e. no filters other than lots lands on Zillow? For example, if I'm targeting five acre properties with an estimated market value of $40,000 and up, is that the same criteria I would be using to determine if a prospective county is active? Thanks. Yeah, yeah. See, I like that question. It's getting into the the weeds a little bit. Yeah, that was deep. <laughs> <laughs> but you should be comparing apples to apples. So if you're trying to figure out market activity for a certain particular county, now we do a lot of rural properties. So our, our properties are five acres or 10 acres and above most of the time, mm-hmm. most of these areas. So I would be looking at just that range of properties if I'm trying to determine the you know how active that market is for those types of properties okay you're saying that like you're you want to be looking specifically at the ones you're buying not just the market as right. a broad sense exactly yeah okay. so i wouldn't include in my you know in my data i wouldn't include like the infill lots and things because those are different you know those are different like sometimes you know uh, a market within a particular city or something like that is way different than the market in these kind of rural areas which mm-hmm. which we focus on a lot of times so i filter out all those smaller properties that are not pertinent to the list that I am building. So, Mm -hmm. and obviously when I'm looking at comps and things like that, I'll look at, you know, the sometimes, especially if a market is changing, I'll look at the most recent comps or the better comps generally. I think when you're first starting to look at an area, you're probably looking at all of it. Mm -hmm. Like you're doing a broad search, right? Mm -hmm. Because you're not 
initially looking five to ten. Like, like what would catch your eye is that the market's moving or there's activity in the market as a sense. Then you would do that next layer mm -hmm. and be like, okay, what is my kind of specialty within that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, you know, you just want to get a feel for what's happening with that particular asset type that you're planning on buying. Right. And that actually could tell you if you just looked at it the other way, as opposed to when you're searching for thing, like he's looking at it on a, on a property specific thing. When you're trying to decide what your niche is, you would look at that mm -hmm. and say, okay, so this area is hot. But then if you filter out that it's mostly the infill lots that right. are going, then you That's want to be targeting the, yeah. the infill. Don't do the big ones necessarily. Mm -hmm. Right. You know? Yeah. If, yeah, exactly. Like, so you've got to, you've got to, Kind of refine that that information and kind of really figure out what's what so mm -hmm. okay well i mean i think that's it did you have anything else you wanted to add well nothing really to add heather aside from the fact that i'm super excited about this training program the other couple plugs that i want to give are our income reports we oh, yeah. haven't talked about that but i put a lot of time into the, is these income reports so if you're listening audio only definitely check out youtube or and or our website um, I do a monthly income report where I break down what exactly is happening in our land flipping business. So, you know, how much revenue we did that month, how much profit we did that month, each and every deal that we did, you know, like what we bought them for, what we sold them for, the profit, how many days we held them for, a bunch of notes on these properties. So do a video version and also a version that's a text blog post version on our website, turningprofit.com. And uh, yeah, I guess that's about it. And also I... I put a lot of time into creating another thing on our website. You can find it on our website. It's called our 50 first deals. And that's actually exactly what it sounds like. These are the 50 first deals that we did in the land flipping business. These are all the properties that we bought exactly the numbers and you know how it all worked out. So you have to give your name and your email so you can get on my email list. But uh, that's what I give you in return. I think if you're interested in this business, I think it'll be super valuable to you as well. And even if you don't care how much time Pete's put into it, I mean, I can vouch for that. The information is what mm -hmm. it's really. It's stuff that I wish was available when I really started getting into this business. It wasn't. It just there wasn't anyone out there doing it. And I, I, don't, I still don't know of anyone that's really doing it to the level that that we're doing on the, on this stuff and the transparency and everything. So that's just kind of what I'm trying to do. Well, I think it's important because then people can see what the possibility is. And then you break down each deal so you can see, okay, oh, you know, that pie wasn't the best move. I'm not going to make that move. Or I like what he did there. That's how he was able to make that much money on it. Right. But being able to see the good, the bad, the, you know, your lessons you've learned, you don't hold back. And the, that's where the value is. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I try to be as transparent as possible. Honestly. Honestly, Heather, I try to be as transparent. To be honest as with you, yeah. Um, but you said one other one earlier, and I was like, "Man, he's." I can't. Remember, I need to write him something down. Something about thinking, thinking about it, or I don't know what I said. I was thinking, or something. Yeah, no, there was even one other one that I didn't call okay. you out on. I was well, like, oh. "I'll have to work on that and not say those things anymore." Well, I hope you're being honest. I'm continually trying to work on these things. Huh? You may not notice. Hmm. Uh, Internal things uh, that happen. You haven't said "uh." Try not to say "uh." I know. Well, if we could all. Those just... are filler words. They're spacer words so that you can think. Your brain is, it's a its a reasonable thing. Your brain's trying to, it is a filler so that your brain can catch up. Right. So it's better to pause though. I used to say so all the time. I oh, still say so. it. So, so, you know, so. that's another filler word. So hopefully I won't say that as much anymore. It's, I'm working, I'm a work in progress. Heather. I know. Well, honestly, we appreciate you guys joining yes, us. Yes, definitely. And to be honest, Pete really does too. <laughs> I really do. And he's been thinking about you all. Yes. Well, thank you. Appreciate it. See you next week. <laughs> Bye. Bye.